Right. So, okay, Indonesia, um, there's lots of moderate Muslims and I think we should worry about our diplomacy. And this is just one reason why diplomacy matters. Um, they have a terrible problem with terrorists trying to infiltrate, as I, you know, as I said last time, the high school kids, they, they have these clubs getting back to the good old, good old time religion. And then from there, they recruit the ones they think might be violent. Um, anyway, so everybody gives first reaction. Um, oh, wait. Yeah. Wait, first everybody gives their first reaction, then I'll talk some more, of course. Um, anybody want to start? You're gonna get called on. Okay, Titus, it's you. Okay, I was just making my way to the article. Let's see. This works. Um, I can have other students sharing the screen too, if they want to pick out something, right? If you want to refer, put on the screen, the article that you're reacting to. Um, okay. Anyway, what it, you got, Titus? All right, I finally pulled it up. It is the... JP religion folder, that article. So the one, I guess it's a quote that I picked, it's really a bullet point, was it was talking about basically purpose in life through a connection to a community in a natural world more specifically needing experiential learning, not abstract, in which I do, yes, obviously experience is the best teacher, but the reason I don't always agree with that is because I feel like experience is the best teacher because the consequences are the most dire. So I feel like if you, I feel like it should be more of a last resort than the most, reliable resort because typically once you and I'm obviously talking about bad things here once you get to the point where you have to experience something there's it's most likely too late to learn it like there's probably consequences that you can't get out of and stuff like that so as though I do agree that you need experiential learning I feel like it's best to avoid it if possible What do other people say about that? What would be the counter argument to that? How could anybody disagree with that? Uh, I guess I can, if I were to make an own counter argument to mine is, like I said, if it's about good things, I took a psychology class here, but it was way too long ago, freshman year, but I think we were talking about positive reinforcement, where you're basically rewarded with good things whenever you do something good. So I guess in that way, if you have good experiences by because of something you've done, then yes, that's the best way to learn. And it's the quickest way to learn. So in that way, experience could be the overall best way. I guess that's the one counter argument I could think of at this point. Well, I think you guys are going to be surprised when I tell you what the counter argument is. And it's, it's interesting because our culture has wiped it out. Even when we're doing it, we don't even know what we're doing. So it's this class, OK? because this class is about patterns, right? It's about stepping back. So it's about if you suffer and you suffer unjustly, you can think, okay, this isn't just about me, right? It's about the human condition or this. So like all of those news articles 
what I was trying to get you to see is there's all these same patterns, right? I, I assume you noticed that, Titus, right? That this is a Muslim country and yet they have all the same problems we have, right? <laughs> with tolerant religion versus intolerant religion, with the people who are least tolerant or least educated and most desperate. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm honestly not too surprised because their religion is set up similarly to ours in most parts. Obviously, there are a couple of details that are different. And for some reason, we're making the biggest deal out of it. But overall, I yeah, can it's a see- personal God. It's an ultimate judgment. It's heaven or hell, right? As opposed to Confucius, Buddha, Hindu, humanism. But, um, but that's where when if all you have is experience then all you have is stories that don't fit any kind of pattern or meaning so i mean here's the problem i know black people that go after policemen my brother was a policeman and a black man went after him right that's it right that's it everybody's got a story and so nobody's stepping back right Nobody's stepping back to look at the pattern and figure out the causes and try to fix them. If all you have is experience, you have a crapshoot. Does that make sense? Everybody's hasty generalization. Everything is absurd. Just go pray to Jesus. The only solution is to pray to Jesus. That's it. Does everybody get this? (laughs) It's annoying. Because honest to goodness, our educational system eliminated wisdom. It eliminated this kind of pattern recognition and you don't get it in psychology classes. The kinds of patterns that they look for are not these kinds of literature-based, humanities-based patterns. They're, um, you know, they're data, patterns in data. Does, Does everybody understand that? Do you understand that? I mean, come on, nod, shake. I mean, if you don't, let me know. You guys, you are really stoic. Like, you're giving me a poker face. What is this? Ah, <laughs> um, uh, well, I'm gonna, I'll go through. Everybody can um, say something, and then I'll I'll. See figure out where to go next. Okay, Mariana. I'll go. Um, just one of my main points was um, like showing emotions toward like certain problems and issues in the world. Um, and that, whenever I was sort of reading about that, it was like, um, it made me think of seeing the dog commercials like on TV. And if anyone knows what I'm saying, like, the humane society ones and it would do the sad song and like for 50 cents a day just things like that and it's like I feel like things don't bother people enough because like I don't know if it doesn't bother you watching an innocent person die or poverty or things like that I just feel like we don't show enough emotion or our emotion doesn't strike anything in us enough that was one of my main points. Go ahead, Akaya. I just want to comment on Mary Hannah's. I um I just feel like with that, um, maybe like when people see stuff like that, they just think, oh, it's not affecting me, so that's why I'm not concerned about it. You know what I'm saying? Like, what I do know those commercials that you're talking about, and like I'll see them, and I'm like, yeah, that is so sad. But like, you have people who are like, oh, they'll be fine, or it's not affecting me, so I'm not worried about it. So. That's just how I feel about that. Mm. I definitely agree. Also, another point is, I think, especially from the television point of view, is that people have seen those commercials so many times that I believe they just become desensitized to it. Like, I guess if you're, you're watching it, it's natural to think that oh, somebody else is probably going to take care of it. And it kind of gives you an excuse of not being the one to take action yourself, to just rely on people you don't even know to 
take care of a problem. And I guess it also kind of explains the emotionless list, why people don't feel anything or not anything, but don't feel, I guess, that passion to do something because you see one about dog commercials, then you see one about St. Jude, and then you see one about poor people in, let's see, I forgot what country it was. At, but you see all the, that's good, Myanmar. <laughs> yeah, then you see all those back to back to back. So I can see how people get desensitized very quickly, especially seeing them multiple times a day, every day. But I'm not saying that's an excuse to not do anything about it. But I'm just trying to get in the minds of others. And that's like one example to like, as little as that, like animal abuse to as big as, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement and things like that. Like it can go from one extreme to the other. I think it's kind of like, um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with like the bystander effect. Um, but kind of like a, a mental, like not, I mean, the bystander effect obviously is in our head, um, but it's, it's like a, like a, another version of the bystander effect, but within, uh, within society and within other, other things that are happening as well. Don't you think you should step back and think, okay, what is an emotionally mature person, right? What is flourishing? What, what should your emotions be? that you don't overreact or underreact, that you have things in perspective. And that'll change over time, right? Um, but I, and again, that's, that's what ancient classical wisdom cultures really do care about that. They wanna educate your emotions. Whereas moderns want to control your behavior, right? And they, and they tend, there's a history there where well, we don't make judgments, right? We're just objective observers. And so, you know, you, you just, you're going to be the objective observer and you ask, well, uh, Mary Hannah, wh what was your opinion about when your husband beat you? <laughs> right? I was just like, I'm not, you know. I'm totally detached. It's, that's just a lie, right? I mean, it's one thing to just tell her you shouldn't let that happen and blah, blah, right? Because she has her own reasons. But on the other hand, you know, to pretend that you're just this completely detached. I mean, why would you want to be a detached observer, <laughs> right? So, I mean, the question is, what is the appropriate thing to do if you find out some woman's getting beaten and she seems to comply, right? So, I don't know. I just think it's a really that you should uh, make it problematic and be self-consciously aware and just ask yourself, what do I think is the most mature way to be? Because you know, there's 171 quotes where in the Quran where God is merciful, right? And 17 quotes where God is vengeful or something like that. And you could do the same with the Old Testament. Well, I don't know. What do you come away with? Well, most of the time you should be merciful and sometimes you should get PO'd. <laughs> well, that's okay. Thanks, Bible. Thanks, Quran. Now I got to figure out when, what, who, why, the devil's in the details. But you do get to under see that it's a pattern, right? I'm just a person in a type of situation. This is nothing personal. And there's a pattern. And the way I handle this one, I can learn from for the future, right? And if I make a mistake, I can learn because I can think, I have it, think about it in a way where I can see an analogy and I'll recognize a similar situation. And I can say, last time I overreacted this, so I have to be careful. Does everybody understand what I'm getting at? Is that you try to, try to find patterns 
You try not to have absolute rules. <laughs> and it's a process. There's no silver bullets. Um, uh, so Mary Hannah, is that at all related to what you were saying? Yes, ma'am. Is it? <laughs> I mean, it kind of went away a little bit, but yes, it is. Who else wants to go next? Everybody's gonna go. Well, okay, Michael. Um, so one of the points that I saw on the uh, the, the the JP the educator file JP religion folder uh, was the they said Whitehead and then the essence of education is that uh, is that it is to be religious um, and I I mean I, I feel like that's that I feel like that is not the essence of education uh, I feel like that's quite actually the opposite perhaps okay okay. Um, so that was one of the, 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 the things I wanted to bring up, I guess. Okay, you, the rest of you, you must react. Somebody's got to react. Okay, well, maybe it would be what he means by religious. And, you know, so you would say it's got to be humanistic, right? I think that's, is that what you mean? That humanism would be the base and then some people would be religious, can link their religion to that, but it really has to be virtue-based. Right, right, oh. because, yeah, because I mean, the, the, with, you know, we know that within religion, you don't always get these virtues. And so therefore our, the, religion, the religion should not be the basis of the education because, um, you know, we, we see many a time where, you know, the religion has uh, corruption and bigotry and hypocrisy, and clearly those aren't things that we want to base our education system off of. So that's a case where I think, again, he's showing his privilege that he's isolated, and he's privileged that he, it wouldn't occur to him that that word is going to mean something different to most other people. And he's going to go, oh, that's not what I meant. But I'd say, Mr. Whitehead, get out of the office, <laughs> you know, talk to people, and you would not use that word that way, right? Um, you might want to say spiritual in the sense of living for the sake of something greater than yourself. But again, there's plenty of people for whom even the word spiritual is going to go down that path of hypocrisy and manipulation, right? And so you could just say, Mr. Whitehead, you need a reality check. Um, it's, you should say humanistic in the sense of humane, right? Not technologically or rational, but humane or holistic or something. Does that make sense, Mike? Um, does everybody mm -hmm. else understand that, you know, this class has been about that stuff and about these words and how they can get so manipulated so easily because we do need to develop those virtues, right? <laughs> because if we don't make the effort, then we will decline, right? There's no way you're gonna automatically react to situations involving pleasure and fear without having thought about it or without your parents having raised you to behave a certain way. Does that make sense? Um, anybody else want to comment about that Whitehead comment about religious? Anyway, in Indonesia, the curriculum does include God. It's just that it has to include Confucian, Hindu, Buddhist, Protestant, Catholic, right? So, um, so needless to say, there's a lot of people working pretty hard to figure out, well, what kind of educational system <laughs> are we going to have, right? And that, you know, they're very concerned because they don't want teachers to start indoctrinating, right? Or they want the word God to unify people. 
and they know the dangers, how easily it could go the other way. Um, so we have Akaya and Caitlin left. Caitlin, go ahead. Um, so I actually had written down the same quote that Tadas talked about, but I kind of talked in a different way. Um, the quote was, finding meaning and purpose in life through a connection to community and the natural world, need experiential learning, not abstract. And I kind of talked about it in relating to like humanism and kind of how like the founding fathers um, based, like how we base off of, um, like they talked about Confucius rather than religion because it's so like, I was taking like the not abstract as in like the religious side of like having like morals and virtues um, so I just thought that was interesting in finding the purpose and meaning to life, not just through abstract thinking. Well, Confucius Analects are pretty concrete, right? Is that, is that what you're getting at, Caitlin? Uh, yeah. Anybody else want to comment on that? That you don't have this reference to God, God will take care of it or something like that. You know, you don't you don't get the cheat sheet. It's called the Deus Ex Mahina. You can't explain something, you can only have, oh, must be God, you know. So that's what they wanted Confucius to. Okay, Confucius Analects are just, you gotta do this. Go ahead, Titus. Well, I actually think I commented something about this a long time ago, but the reason I feel like if God wanted to interfere this much or as much as they are blaming him, I'd say we wouldn't have the knowledge to do it ourselves. Like there's no point in having such knowledge to fix these problems if God was going to do it the whole time. It would pretty much be useless. So I feel like the reason he gave us knowledge and the ability to adapt and think is so we can get to the point to where we're solving our own problems and improving from there, not so he can just step in and fix everything. Not only that, that would make you morally accountable, right? Right. That too. <laughs> Yeah, it's, I think the pattern recognition, right? You can't say, well, I didn't know greed was bad, right? <laughs> or I didn't know, you know, blah, blah. Well, you know, you got a lot of stories and you're capable of making patterns, right? You're capable of understanding why that story is that way and applying it to your life. So I don't know, I if I were anybody, I'd be pretty scared, given that we can know. That would make us pretty accountable, right? <laughs> I don't know. Akaya, what have you got? So I um, commented on, where is it? At? Um, it talked about, oh, um, there was something that said like, there were banners or whatever announcing seminars to create Muslim intolerance. And I just thought that that was kind of crazy that people were going out of their way to like discriminate towards Muslims. And then I talked about um, how people of their, of other faiths are being marginalized and like they're being forced to return to like traditional values. And I just, um, it just made me realize that like if people are so solely based on traditions if their life is surrounded by tradition then there's no like new ideas and people are being sheltered and it's like they're being coerced coerced into like these traditional beliefs and I just feel like maybe those um people who are who do hold those traditional beliefs maybe they don't want to like deal with the fact of new ideas or maybe they just don't want to um have any like anything more on their plate or whatever and I just feel like staying with those traditional values can also create a divide because you have people who are trying to um, change the world and bring about new things but if the traditions are always the same then there's no change 
That's Martin Luther King said that, right? So here's the here's the interesting thing, right? Way early in the class, we had Euthyphro, and he said, you know, I know what God wants. It's cut and dried. You know, my dad killed somebody, which actually it was more complicated than that, but okay. And then we had those news articles. Do you remember where it was very anti-Islam after 9-11? There were people that said it was the feminists and the gays. It was all their fault. That's why God let this happen, right? So we have that same kind of extremism as they do. Does everybody understand that? So just recognizing these patterns, I think, is important so that then as you deal with them, you don't get too frustrated because it's not as if history all of a sudden is going to change because you decided that you just that you you're going to be a change agent, right? So that somehow, you know, everybody's going to be wiser, <laughs> but you still have to position yourself. And then, you know, if you want to say, I want to be a change agent that doesn't overreact or underreact, right? That doesn't threaten or humiliate or degrade traditionalists, but just tries to move them forward and persuade them that we have to move forward, right? But there are people in Indonesia who thought the tsunami, the cause of it was that Indonesia was becoming too materialistic and too Western, and their women were getting too uppity and going to school. And so God, you know, is putting them back in their place, those feminists. And like, well, I mean, who are we to say that that's backward thinking? <laughs> and, you know, the ultimate revelation is that Jerry Falwell, who said that, now has a son who's totally corrupt, and he just loves sex and money, and that's been exposed, and Liberty University is taking this huge hit because their leadership is corrupt, but that's what happens when you're just self-righteous and you hide behind traditional religion, um, and that ha it happened. that's happening all over the world. A lot of authoritarian leaders are hiding behind religion. Then they're getting caught literally with their pants down <laughs> or with their pocketbooks, you know, siphoning off money. So that's kind of what I wanted to get at. Um, any other comments about those articles? I just remember sitting, you know, in coffee shops. There's, there was a coffee shop. Uh, in a big mall, which M-A-U-L is the way I spell that, but it was a Starbucks and it was sort of at one end and I would get the Jakarta Post and I would start reading it and I just thought, oh my God, this is so much like America and it's so much like every country in the world. There are always people like me trying to emphasize holistic education trying to say that the original leaders were like that, um, trying to build the bridges. And then there's always this conflict and it's related to class and education. And um, there, you know, Indonesia, it's variations on a theme, right? All of these leaders, as we've noticed, were protectors of minorities. They all stood up against the establishment um, and, you know, you can quote Mohammed, he was very tolerant, but I mean, the Taliban is not tolerant, <laughs> and they say they're Muslim. Okay, so now we had this one. I think this was another one I asked you to respond to. Um, the reasons they had for studying, and my point on the video was that um, America has more programs in public policy and public administration and public this and that than any other country in the world, and yet Americans don't believe in it. Americans vote for people who have no qualifications 
for leadership, right? They have, the president of the US has to negotiate with 171 countries, have to, has to develop diplomatic relationships. And we vote for people who have never had any experience in diplomacy at all. It's just very bizarre. I, was, I don't get it, right? What's the resume? What sort of CV are you looking for when you're basically hiring someone for these jobs? But anyway, so I, I just wanted to get a reaction from you all about these students. Do they sound like you? Um, did, did I ask you to react to those? Was that one of the ones I asked you? Okay. Um, Michael, why don't you start? Okay, so I just want to make sure. Uh, you're talking about the PowerPoint that has all the your stu Indonesia students. Yes, okay, so the one that I picked out was the, one second. Um, Uh, the the one that wanted to focus on anti-corruption law um uh because i felt like that was like something that was like i feel like i feel like they're trying they what they're wanting to do is like things that every like every every nation has issues with you know and obviously we're like focusing in on it right now but like obviously we you know it would help it wouldn't it wouldn't be bad if we had people who were also going to um focus on anti-corruption law as well uh, and so as I was going through everything um, that like I guess that was kind of the more like higher arching thing that I saw is that these are really like applicable applicable things everywhere um, but you know we're just specifically seeing them uh, within these students from Indonesia. The overall definition is rule for the sake of the rules or rule for the sake of the ruler right so corruption is when you take the power you have and use it to help your friends, <laughs> right? Or yourself, as opposed to use it. Does that make sense? Yes, um, yeah, so I think, again, I like Aristotle because I think his definitions are general and yet they apply, you know? Whereas, um, yeah. Mm. So that's, I think, what corruption is because you are accountable for using your power for the sake of the rules. Go ahead, Mariana. I was just going to go next. Go ahead. Oh, um, my the song that I picked out was the "Go Back Home" one, and I read it and I was like, "Man, wouldn't that be nice?" I mean, I feel like it was listing like a picture perfect world. It was like changing mindsets and culture sets, better organization, changing the pensions, pensions, internal control budgets, better services. I mean, that was like, and then I was just sitting here thinking like, how, why does that seem so hard just for people to do this or to do this? I don't know. That was just like, I kind of just stopped there and was like, how do you even get to that picture perfect world? Because I mean, they listed it. I mean, that, that's like, I mean, I'm sure there are more things obviously, but I feel like there's no, it's almost, that feels impossible, you know? Just well, you do it one step at a time, right? Right. So if one person dedicates their whole life to improving housing for African-Americans, 60 years of their effort, that's got to make a difference, right? But it's one little issue. It's just that everybody has to find some place, right, to engage. It's not utopia. It's realistic. Mm -hmm. People don't do that. It gets worse. Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. I worry when students say it's utopia. No, it's not. This is realism. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's utopia to think you can't, you should, you don't have to aim for that and everything's going to work out fine. That's utopia. Mm -hmm. That makes sense to you? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, let's see who else. Akaya. Um, so I actually uh, focus on the same slide that Michael fo focused on, the anti-corruption law. I think that's what it was. Um, and I just um, feel like, where is it at? Oh my gosh. 
I'll, can I be skipped, please? I'll just, I don't know what happened to my computer. I lost my notes. Okay, Caitlin? Um, I wrote down one quote from one of the slides. I don't remember like which, which one it was on, but it said um, the ultimate melting pot of people from different backgrounds and cultures. And I thought that it was interesting for other people to want to come like study in America just for the fact that we have so many different kinds of people. And I think that's something that maybe we take for granted, especially at line. We're really lucky with like, we get to see a lot of different kinds of people. And so I just thought that was interesting how that would be a reason why they would want to come study in America. Good, yeah, it always has been. It's been a, a great thing. Um, Titus. I just had a overall opinion that kind of answers the question you said at the beginning of why people are voting for these politicians that have no realistic idea of what they're doing or the qualifications. And this was mainly after reading the last, I believe, four to five slides when they talk about specific jobs and go into details about the qualifications of them. And it's really that people feel they don't have en enough time or they just are too lazy to go through those specific qualifications and do the research on each politician and see what they've done to earn their reputation. And politicians know that. So all they do is look for what those type of people, since they are the vast majority, unfortunately, they look for what those type of people are interested in and advertise that and make them seem like I believe it's something Jason referred to a long time ago. I think it was called the beer test, where you basically vote for the person you relate to the most. So I feel like most politicians that do get elected put their efforts more into that, excuse me, instead of the actual qualifications that they need to get jobs done right. Yeah, and then the, the advertisers just really work on getting the person to appear to be somebody that you'd have it rather I mean these people are millionaires you know they're not <laughs> but they're supposed to somehow you know look like some the old I don't know somebody who doesn't have to worry about paying bills is not me right and um anyway yeah that's where advertising comes in um and very powerful. So um, what was I gonna say? Just, uh, oh yeah, okay. What I was gonna say is that I really wanna find uh, a website or a book that does just describe who was on the cabinets since Reagan and what their qualifications were and what that that cabinet, you know, what that division does and then what they did with it. If we could just get that data, right? That's what you need. And it would show a real difference between each party on what really matters. So I'm really gonna try to do that. And it's sort of horrifying that we don't have a book that comes out every year that everybody knows about what the cabinet leaders of each department actually did that year. Does that make sense? I mean, does that make sense to people? Those are the people that should be the experts and then they hire experts or the people who work in those departments get those jobs supposedly because they're experts, right? And so then the president is supposed to appoint someone as an expert and he defers to those experts. That's how it should work. And then when he meets in his cabinet, they advise him based on their expertise. And I don't think, I don't think very many Americans know that, like that that's how it works. Um, but together you have a collective mind, right? And so, um, so citizen consciousness, that's how you develop the sort of collective citizen consciousness. So I'm just gonna work on that.
it's going to be one of my goals this semester to just try and get that together because everything else is just sort of to me a consequence of that that's a major source of the causes of better or worse governance um all right so what else have we got here was there something else i asked you to respond to did i ask you to respond to environmental ethics Okay, somebody tell me if there was anything else I asked you to respond to. This um, is- You asked us for like, like a comment on how linking religion and politics will be a corrupting influence for religion okay. and politics. Yeah, that's, that's this one, the intersection of politics, economics, and religion. Um, and I, yeah, I don't think on the pre- video that I um, I had you read it, right? Because there's reasons I wouldn't have you read it. Um, but there's just lots of examples of that. So what did you say, Michael? Um, so one of the things I talked about is that, um, and this wasn't like specific to uh, the outline, uh, was that sometimes I feel like, uh, especially in the South, it's kind of expected of you to attend church like, within like whatever like job you're going to like the, the, the teachers at my at my school for example like like oh are you going to be there on su for Sunday school you know what I mean I feel like it's like a certain like, like cultural expectation in the south to like go to church uh, and I feel like that that affects like I feel like that affects your your job um, and so that was one of the points I wanted to make as far as um and which church you go to? Right. Yeah. That yes, that could also be a, 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 a defining factor as well. Yes. I know that in Batesville for a while, the president of Future Fuels went to First Baptist, and if you wanted to get in good, you went there. Because <laughs> I had a student whose husband worked there, but she went to the Episcopal Church, and oh boy, you know that was a big deal. <laughs> Okay, go ahead. Anything else? Um, I just feel like in general, because uh, the other part was about um, uh, religion and like how uh, it could be corrupting uh, as far as like politics. And I feel like in politics a lot, we see, um, we see politicians more so trying to uh, target like uh, these different, like, uh, the, um, like these kind of, I don't want to say forced religious ideas, but like, you know, you'll see a politician that, you know, supports um, LGBTQ rights, you know, and they're going to use that uh, with uh, some people, some religious people to gain their vote. Um, and so that was, the, that was kind of my second, like the second point that I was going to bring up. Okay. Who wants to go next? I'll go. And one example going off of Michael, I think there is, I forgot who it was, but it was one of the richest people in our country. Like they were getting a lot of backlash because it was rumored that they were donating towards anti LGBTQ, uh, what you call it, a group of people. I'm not, I want to say it's, it was over a chicken company. I think it may have been Chick-fil-A. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's right. But there's lots of them. It's some Right, of them. they're not the only ones, but right. they're the ones I heard about. So yeah, it's definitely having a, it's definitely creating an impact on them. And another opinion, this is a kind of general one, but it really affects the golden rule because any religion well any use of religion that causes you to do things that, that are clearly not right like I'm going to say Islam since we were just talking about that them beating or being allowed to beat their women like if you're using if you're blaming religion to or if you're losing, using religion as an excuse 
to believe that's the right thing to do, then I feel like that's pretty corrupt. Okay, yep. Um, you could write a whole final paper on varieties of that. Okay, Mary Hannah, go ahead. I can just kind of go off what Tata said for my point, but I was kind of um, more so talking about like the separating of religion and state. And I feel like that's one of the main reasons why we can't use like one set religion is because um, excuses mainly. I feel like that's one. But also, um, I mean, I feel like on one hand, if people, I don't know, followed their religion more, like were more Christian-like, I guess, or whatever they believe, they wouldn't be like entitled to like judge people, discriminate, you know, if we live by like one way. But on the other hand, you can't expect all people to believe the same and still have like a free nation. So the part about like separating religion and state, I feel like there are a lot of advantages and disadvantages, but I feel like it would do more harm than good because you can't act, mainly you can't act solely on religion. Like you, I feel like you do have to have like those virtues and whatnot in it. And I just feel like once you get to like a government power, you can't, you know, obviously, I don't think it would, I do think it'd be do more harm than good by combining religion and state. That's why the founders wanted Confucius Analects, right? That makes sense to you that they would be so concerned about that? Yeah, okay. Um, Akaya? So I um, essentially talked about, um, on the outline, it was like point three about the religion, conservative or progressive, and it talked about Bush's top advisors. I'm so sorry. Hold on. <laughs> okay, Caitlin. Um, so I know I kind of like you just mentioned the founding fathers, and that's kind of also what I focused on because, like it talked about, and I had this in my worldview too. Um, basing where's it at? It was talking about how you can't. Um, like how they wanted to use Confucius because religion causes so much controversy because not everyone has the same religion and like in the United States we have freedom of religion so people are have the right to choose their own religion they shouldn't be expected to follow like like not everyone's a Christian so they're not everyone shouldn't be expected to follow basis of Christian like virtues and stuff so like using Confucius just like kind of gets rid of the controversy of religion even though like I didn't know the founding fathers weren't as like they weren't Christians so that is like something that was shocking to me and I hope that more people learn that so they were humanist first right and yeah various degrees of uh conservative religion but none of them were really they were deists which means they wanted to synthesize Newtonian science with Christianity. That was really important to them. So because they wanted to found that, you know, our documents are Enlightenment documents and the Enlightenment was based on Newtonian mechanics. Yeah, it is, Caitlin, it, don't you think it's kind of crazy that that is just a matter of fact, like I'm not, political but it it seems like it's gotten so political right Caitlin yeah, I, I think it's so crazy because like I had never heard that and now it just like every time it's like well the founding fathers were they liked Confucius so nobody <laughs> even knows like I feel like nobody knows <laughs> yeah well good for you Caitlin I just yeah I didn't even know I mean stuff I didn't know I didn't know there were these Muslim Aristotelians so you just get so annoyed, like my education is really indoctrination, right? And, and now legally, you're not allowed to, to do anything. You know, I mean, that, that's really a mess. All these state laws not allowing you to basically uncover some of this junk and look a little deeper. So it might, 
each of you might have to just take it into your own hands to do it. <laughs> and if nobody's giving you hemlock, you should be grateful. <laughs> or nobody's nailing you to a tree or something. Um, just hang in there. Okay, Akaya, we're ready. I'm so sorry about that. All so right. I talked about, like I said, the religion, conservative or progressive, and it talked about, um, um, it was like, it talked about Bush's, George Bush's, well, President Bush, his advisors, and how they were ridiculing evangelicals as nuts and goofy to, like, get their votes, and it just made me think of, like, going back to, like, greed and doing any, anything by any means necessary in order to be on top of everybody or ahead of everybody, looking down on people, and it also made me think of this show that I watch. I don't know if you guys know, it's called Manifest, and essentially like the government is behind doing experiments on people and it's like they don't care about the emotions of others and I also feel like it goes into like the qualifications of people because you know you have people who are hired to do certain things and they they're like corrupt and they're like sneaky and they're like behind the scenes and stuff like that so that's just what I yeah but you, do, you really do have to find out who's qualified and who's not. There are thousands, 10,000s of people who could make more money, but they really want to have a nice middle-class democracy. Um, so, and then there's other people who are opportunists who really couldn't make money or power, but as long as they're loyalists, to a party, they can be promoted and have a lot more power and money than they would otherwise have, right? I mean, it only makes sense and it's always been true. So you do have to look, try to get, find out the backgrounds. But honestly, if I, if I find a website or I find a book, I think I'll just let my students from the past know because those are just facts. They are, right? This is not an opinion about, you know, anyway. So I think it would clear the air a lot too on a lot of stuff. So we'll see, I, I, gotta, I gotta do that. Um, all right, so now you're all ready for some pretty pictures and some funny stories. I have funny stories too, really funny stories. <laughs> um, Okay, so let me start with nurturing democracy in Indonesia. Um, and again, I'm embarrassed. I was totally ignorant, didn't know anything about the fourth largest country with all these moderate Muslims. But anyway, so what happened to me, I was very lucky. Most of the people on Fulbrights live in a certain area of Bandung where it's all Europeans, expatriates, English speaking, they have this European food grocery store and they have this bookstore with English and they sort of live near each other, right? They're kind of isolated. But my guy, Tajul, I was teaching his class for him and he was gonna translate. He got a house, he rented a house in a neighborhood so that whenever I walked around, everybody knew, you know, this is totally bizarre to have somebody from somewhere else in their neighborhood. And um, then this is his niece and her husband worked on an Exxon oil rig. So he was gone. And so he asked his niece to come and live in this house with me. And so she cooked for me. <laughs> She cleaned for me. She did my laundry. I finally told her to stop ironing my underwear. And then every night she gave me a foot massage. Oh my God. <laughs> I mean, those things cost money, right? Oh my God. Now every night I go to bed and I think, oh boy, I need a foot massage. I didn't know I needed one until I started getting them. But anyway, she, um, it was very interesting because she was the age of my youngest daughter, who I had to leave back in ninth grade when I got my job at Lion. I had to leave her back in Minnesota and I was 
part of me, you know, just grieves about that. On the other hand, her mother died when she was little. So I was like her substitute mother and she was my substitute daughter and we got along so well. But so her mother died and her grandmother raised her. And so there she is. Uh, her grandmother and relatives live in this tiny little village. There isn't really a road to the village. It's like two concrete there's concrete blocks in two lines, you know, for your tires to go on so you didn't get stuck in the mud. It's not really a road. And, um, and her grandmother was just sitting in the living room there and there's no hospital with all these smells and bells and all these fancy machines and all this stuff, you know, there's no nursing home. But she's just gonna sit there and get taken care of by somebody who loves her and she's gonna die, right? And I'm just thinking in terms of quality of life, right? You're dying with people you love. It's, we need to rethink the, the idea that technology makes everything better. Um, these are my neighbors. Um, so that's what it was like. There would be little rice patties right in the middle of the, the yards. Uh, people did throw garbage, however, in the streams. But to me, you know, you don't, you're not self-righteous about this. Their overall carbon footprint was one one hundredth of mine, right? So I'm not going to sit there and say, gee, they throw garbage because that's nothing by comparison. This is the, you know, the slide I sent home saying, hey, everybody, I'm fine. Um, but the other thing is that, that I, okay, so I asked Tajul, well, what am I supposed to wear? You know, how covered up, you know? And he just said, well, we'll go shopping when you get here. And so I was thinking, oh my God, I'm gonna have all these black burka and all this stuff. But no, it turns out that their headscarf is often their fashion statement, right? And um, they, they have beautiful headscarves. But I bought these really cheap headscarves that were made of like polyester because they didn't fall off. I couldn't get the dang things to stay on. But this journalism uh, person was talking to me. She said, have you seen those really cheap headscarves? They're like t-shirts. You know? I said, yeah, I just bought five of them. She thought they were pretty low life, you know. Um, but I have my t-shirt headscarf. So, okay, it's rainforest country. And so we're driving and there's the volcano and it's kind of letting out smoke. And I was thinking, ah, what is this? And uh, in Jakarta, one time, a volcano just exploded with no warning at all. Like the one out in Oregon was huffing and puffing for a long time before it actually exploded. But they have terrible problems with earthquakes and tsunamis and uh, cyclones, you know, and floods. Um, but anyway, there it is. It's beautiful in its own. It's gorgeous. There's Tajul and there's the school, the name of the school. Um, it was a, an Islamic State University and it's named after a famous teacher. And then we actually had school. This is my class. Um, on my birthday and so I went and bought a cake and they really were amazed at how informal I was because in a, a developing country if you have a PhD you know you're treated in a very formal way it's like you know there's a high high level of respect um, but they kind of liked me because I was just you know Americans in general have been like that you know the show Beverly Hillbillies you know, Uncle Jed is this billionaire, but he's just kind of a hick and he, he doesn't, <laughs> he's unaffected. And so that's kind of the way Americans are. They're kind of these rich, friendly folks that don't have a lot of decor. Anyway, so they got their independence. I think I said this before. Um, he was the founding father. Then he, you know, there was so much political unrest. He just sort of took over and um, 
became president for life and he made ties to China. So then his military guy claimed that uh, the communists are taking over and he conducted a coup and um, he had fake elections, but then he did promote development and he did offer, make this offer to Islamic schools to teach, we'll give you money, you teach Western thought, feminism, all this stuff. Um, so then finally, uh, what I told my um, Indonesian students, because they were discouraged about corruption, but I said their generation was the first generation that actually has elections every four years or six years where actually there's no coups and it's not rigged. So instead of being sad about the corruption, they should realize the reason they know there's corruption is that they do have a free press, you know, like before they didn't have a free press. There was no corruption before in the good old days. What do you mean? You know? And also that they have laws and that when you break the laws, you know, you go to court and you do find out sometimes the judge gives the, the, the aristocrats uh, lower sentences and stuff, but at least the process is transparent and there's some level of accountability. So I just tried to encourage them not to get too distracted. Then I, or discouraged. Then I talked about Western and I dressed up like these people and then Tajul said, oh, there's something like that in Islam. So it's a multicultural democratic or republic, you know, you have elected officials. This is Ramadan. The last week I was there, they were fasting and every night they would come. And um, the, the kids decide when they're going to start fasting, usually junior high, somewhere in there. Um, but I couldn't do it. Like, <laughs> I'm too weak. Um, this is after school, they would come to the mosque and learn Arabic, um, just like there's a lot of Jewish kids that go to Hebrew school and there's, um, oh, there's Hmong kids and Cambodian kids in the St. Paul that do learn their native language. Um, here's where I taught in Jogja. So I'm just, um, there's one of my classes. They really liked, me to talk about democracy in Greece because I just told them, you know, the story of, of democracy gives you a lot of ideas about how to set up a democracy. And then it gives you a lot of ideas about corruption, right? How to avoid corruption. So it was fun, you know, I got to lecture it in the context of Indonesia. Um, and they also, you know, they liked my English because they know I have that Midwestern accent, which is really kind of the ideal. And I, I you know, I didn't do anything to earn it. Um, so there they are. Uh, Plato's Academy. I talked about Plato's Academy. They liked it a lot. They were surprised because they had this stereotype that the Greeks were pagans and secularists and anti-religion, right? They just assumed, oh, that's paganism, that's not religion. And when they found out, no, no, <laughs> there's this huge bridge, you know, they really liked that. They really understood what I was saying about if you are, you know, if you want to synthesize Confucianism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, uh, Protestant, Catholic, the Greeks are a really good way. And, and really, it was amazing. They really kept inviting me to give guest lectures and everything. Then I talked about nonviolent demonstrations. I talked about my dad and Selma. And I participated in a lot of nonviolent demonstrations in my life. Many, many, many. So I talked about that and how important it is. Um, then why should anyone get a degree? What's the purpose? Um, this is uh, where I lived with uh, Ranti. And so on Saturday nights, I always invited them to come. And again, they were really amazed, right? That professors usually don't do that. 
And so there they came. And this one man brought his daughter because again, he just keep talking. We want that English. We want to keep learning English. And they all sit on the floor and I'm terrible at sitting on the floor. I have to have my back against something. But, and they eat too many of these snacky foods that they get from the West. You know, naturally, all these foods that are cheap and healthy, right? Bananas and coconuts and all this stuff. And then they go and eat these chips. And oh, uh, Anyway, uh, they're all getting diabetes and they're getting overweight and it's just not good. But there's my class. Um, and then I encourage them to come to America, study, learn from America, but go home and become the best Indonesians, right? Make your nation the best nation that it can be. Don't try to be America. Like we've got our own issues. We have our own strengths and weaknesses. Um, and so, so just adapt, right? Adapt what you learn in America, take the pattern, go home, uh, apply it in your situation. Um, then I just, again, mentioned Aristotle's virtues. This was practical wisdom. Um, there are all these women who are majoring in management. This is just going to be a huge shift. So when I teach in, um, in, in Bangladesh, all these women, I just keep telling them, you know, you are literally carving out a space, a cultural space. And so in America, 50 years ago, you know, the, those awful feminists, they really did carve out a space for you, right? And so like Akaya said, it isn't that problematic anymore. But, but if you go to these developing countries, right? They are the need to be the pioneers. Um, so let's see, here's the, how to combine science and religion. They wanted holistic education. So those, uh, those uh, editorials talked about that. So they, you know, I got a lecture, I gave a lot of lectures on that. Um, Indonesia's important contribution to this paradigm because it is multi-religious. Uh, so I encouraged them. Um, I really didn't come there just to lecture them about how you can be more about us, more like us. I really see it as teamwork. Um, so there's, then they are working a lot on their curriculum, obviously. Um, all right, let's see. Here are all the institutions that need to develop in order to maintain democracy. And that's true in the US. Uh, families, extended families, social life, political life, informal and formal education just like in Greece, just like the US, um, scientific philosophy, literature. So I talked about rhetoric and how politicians abuse words and they're all nodding, <laughs> right? I mean, they all get it. Um, then this one was where I went to a small high school, an Islamic high school, the kids are poor, but they come there and then they have a farm and they sell, they make and sell um, honey and uh, milk and uh, chickens and eggs. And then that's how they make enough money to keep the school going. And they did all these uh, traditional dances and rituals for me. I was just, I was the honored guest and I had my entourage, I had my translator. And it was really, <laughs> It was amazing, like, huh? I mean, at one point, I really had little kids and did not know where we were going to live a month from then with a little kid. And until I was 50, I didn't know where the next meal was coming from. So for me to sit there and be like the great diplomat from the US, it was, it was a shock. Um, then I, I, I went there and I stayed near these these girls were in charge of taking care of me and um this one is named olive and she was the the number one in charge she used to go with me to the 7-eleven and i could buy my little 
American cheese and stuff because the spicy foods got to me. I, I couldn't eat a lot of that stuff. Um, the other thing was in Chirabone, um, the guy, I told him I was a vegetarian. And he didn't know what to feed me. And so there was one vegetarian entree that he knew of. I can't remember the name of it anymore, but every single meal, the whole time I was there, I got the same thing, uh, but that's okay. <laughs> anyway, we, she would take me to 7-Eleven. And, um, oh yeah, I invited these kids in to my bedroom and they sat on my bed and there was a boy too. His name was um, uh, Derry, okay? So there were three girls and a boy he used to come and at first, when they came, they were just like, oh, my God, I'm in the professor's bedroom and I'm sitting on her bed. This is really bizarre. But after that, you know, I just asked them, well, what do you guys want to do? And how is it that you came to want this and all this stuff? And so then they started coming every day. It was like, cool. Um, but it turns out that Olive married dairy <laughs> and they actually met on my bed <laughs> but you can't say that right on my bed <laughs> but yeah and he is he qualified to get a full scholarship to get a phd in australia and so right now they are in australia he's getting a phd in teaching English, he's going to go back to the number one Islamic State school, and he's going to teach English because they have spotted him as a really good person to carry the torch for the next 50 years. But as a matter of fact, um, Tajul emailed me at one point, and he said that Derry did not pass the TOEFL test, the English test. And could I pay for him to take it again? And so, sure, you know, if I can spend 175 bucks and change this guy's life forever, like, <laughs> it's a great opportunity. It's not that often that you can actually target your giving. So I let him take it. He took it. He qualified for all this stuff. And now, um, yeah, and I actually got to see them after the second time I was in Indonesia and they showed me their wedding pictures and all this stuff. And it was, it was great. Um, so, oh yeah, this is where they told me to talk about terrorism. Um, and there's that, did I tell you about this SOB guy? Did I talk about this SOB guy? <laughs> no, I don't think so. No. Okay. All right. There he is. The SOB guy. Okay. So first of all, I gave my talk about the virtues. And then at lunchtime, we were eating. And all of a sudden, these guys in these white robes uh, come out of this van. And my colleagues were going, oh, my God, they're here. And so apparently, these extremists had come. And they were going to sit and listen to our lecture on terrorism, you know, to see if my colleagues would have trashed their organization as terrorists or something. Uh, because they're pretty rigid, right? And so this guy gives this talk and he gave it in English. Everyone, it was an international conference, so everybody had to speak English. This is where you had the one about fatalism and the one about the high school kids and all that. And um, so I'm taking notes because he says, you know, well, Islam is the only way because only Muhammad knows how to take care of anger and only Muhammad knows this and that. And I thought, you SOB, if you'd, if you'd come in the morning and listen to my lecture, you know that's absolutely not true. So I took these notes and at the end of his talk, I just hammered him and it was like he and me for 20 minutes. And I could tell that the other people were sort of <laughs> rooting for me, you know, because they didn't have the nerve to talk back to this guy. Well, it turns out that there is this organization, right? And there's, and it's more extreme. And there's a question about whether they are recruiting some of these more, you know, the kids that do sign up to take risks. And it turns out this guy is from Southern California. <laughs> Girl. And he's, you know, and he represents this very extreme Islam. 
not, you know, not the Taliban, but I mean, uh, anyway, that was funny. <laughs> um, these things would happen, you know, and you just sort of go, oh, that was an experience. Back to you, um, Titus. That was an experience. And then they wanted me to talk about feminism. And I was like, okay. He, tell, he calls me the night before. All right, whatever. Then they couldn't give me money, but they gave me batik because I really like that. I'm sure you've seen me wearing some of that stuff. Um, then I, there was another one, another seminar. Oh, Crinchy, this was out on an island. Um, oh, yes, these are the funny ones. So I have some funny ones here. All right, so we're driving along and I see this little shop selling food and it's called Marta Bach. And I was like, what? <laughs> what? You know, that's my name, Marta. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like you go to France and there's some, your name is Amilet, right? <laughs> really, it's just like that. And so, um, yeah. There was Martabach, Donald Duck Martabach, and there was Sweet Martabach, and there was uh, Herbal Martabach, and uh, <laughs> Meat Martabach. It turns out it was pretty fried, yucky stuff. I would never eat it, but anyway. And then there's, there was this, trying to sit cross-legged, which I cannot do. And then I got this Hindu sword, which it's too bad you guys aren't going to see it, but I showed it to my grandson. It's like, hey, does anybody else's grandma have a Hindu sword from Indonesia? <laughs> um, and then, oh yeah, I, I don't like hot food. That's a big joke. So Ranti is the, when she, the way she likes her food is that she starts crying and her, wa her nose starts watering. That's how she likes it, that hot right? Ha! <laughs> For me, it was like, no spice, no spice. And she would give me this food that she thought was disgustingly bland, you know, <laughs> but she put up with it, you know. And so this is, they eat with their hands, okay? And so you put the rice and, and then you put the rice on your plate and then you grab a little bit of fish and a little bit of vegetable and then the rice and then you eat it. And, um, you know, it's a much more natural way to eat, truly. You know, there's a mind-body connection there. Uh, you know, northerners don't eat that way because of the weather and all sorts of stuff. But it's not natural. It's very mechanical to eat with silverware, if you really think about it. Um, anyway, so, and then this was the going fishing, you know, it's not like Minnesota. And this is the thing about bamboo. Bamboo is kind of like their duct tape. Like you can use it for anything. Like you can make a three-story house out of bamboo. You can make a bridge out of bamboo. You can make the railing. You can fix the railing because I was walking across this and the railing broke. And um, you can cut up bamboo and put it in soup. One of my favorite soups was bamboo soup. Um, then I lived in this neighborhood and the moms got together on Saturday morning, just like they do everywhere. And all they want is a middle class life. You know, they just want a couple kids and they want food, clothing and shelter. And I'm afraid we're going to have some serious wars for resources, but it's all just based on I just want my two kids. You know, this is the um, the Dutch. Uh, they tried to make a treaty, they broke a treaty, they made a treaty, they broke a treaty. Finally, the people got their independence, but a lot of Dutch people come and try to help Indonesia with their development. Then in the wedding, I went to a wedding and we waited and waited. And then um, Tajul said, oh, it's time to eat. And I said, well, you eat before the wedding? And he said, well, we already had the wedding. It was in this tent because only men can be at the wedding. So it was a little village wedding and everybody walked through the village and then you go sit there. And there was this musical group that was just like the Jackson Five. You know, you could tell they were imitating Michael Jackson and all this stuff. Anyway, so then we get in the line to eat and I don't eat meat, you know, and I don't eat white rice. And so I found this, these green beans and I just piled my 
um, plate with green beans and I put them in my mouth, it turns out they were hot peppers, okay? <laughs> and so Ronti, good old Ronti, like she gives me water, she gives me a banana, she gives me, you know, stuff to try and clear out my sinuses, I guess. This is these puppets who are like the, the guy in a, in a play who says what nobody else will say, right? <laughs> And so they have that tradition. And there's the batik. Um, and there's the Hindu and Buddhist. Um, yeah, it's a multi, multicultural, multi-faith society. And so the question is, can they sustain it, right? Can they avoid getting destabilized, right? Every, every country could get destabilized by military, by the rich. Um, by the majority that are distracted and apathetic and the middle class shrinks and people look for a strong man, right? Every society in the world can decline this way. And then let's just hope they can do it, but let's hope we can do it too because every country is under threat. So um, I guess you'll just have to look at these other pictures yourself but they are beautiful. I don't know. Did any of you look at the ones about, did you, Mariana? They're beautiful, aren't they? Anyway. Yes, they are. So, did you see Kaylin's comment she put in the chat? No. Y'all had the same birthday. Yeah, it was just that we had oh, the same sorry. birthday. Oh, very good. <laughs> you know what we are? Interrupt. <laughs> That's okay. We're, we're Rams. Did you know that, Caitlin? Okay, yeah. Ram. Yes. Okay. Um, so anyway, um, I gotta let you go, but um, it was great. And I do, all I wanna tell you guys, that I never, ever, ever thought that that doors would open to me that have opened. So, um, I mean, I had a little kid in the ghetto of Philadelphia, okay? Like trying to avoid the dog poop. And I mean, you know, it wasn't a picnic. It wasn't as bad as, I mean, a lot of my students have really started out lower, but I'm not somebody you might think I would have been, right? I didn't really grow up with silver spoon or that. And I, I didn't pull myself up as much as a lot of my students, but I just do want you to know there's a lot of doors that could open if you just go through the one that, that opens first, right? And then there's a different set. And then you sort of pick one and then there's a different set. So just hang in there, all right? Okay, bye-bye. Oh, okay, that's okay. I'll do it. I'll